Please stand by as we get ready to launch another episode of this Reality Radio Cafe Cast with your host and my husband, Denny J, K5DCC. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition, lift off. Now grab your glass and get ready to fill it up with some radio on the rocks. Vehicles pitching down range. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of our video cafe cast here in the Digicom Cafe in the beautiful Ozarks of Northwest Arkansas. So, good morning, world, and you too, Professor Jim. Oh, good morning, Denny, and good morning to our guest, David Spolstra, N9KT, November 9 Kilo Tango. Uh, David, uh, we're going to talk about a lot of things today, well, specifically one thing, uh, but Tell us a we little bit. We want to bit. get his stories, what we want. That's right. We tell us a little bit about how you got into ham radio. Okay. Well, um, actually, when I was really young, I got into electronics and um, uh, I built a Radio Shack two transistor shortwave radio. And I strung a bunch of wires up out in the backyard and I listened to people all over the world stations. And I could hear these hams, but if you ever had one of those things, the tuning was so horrible, you couldn't hear anybody. So I got a vernier dial and I hooked it up so I could tune it even finer and I could kind of make out some of it. So I got excited and I wanted to be a ham. So um, I studied the code and everything and I got up to where I could pass the test. And I went and I took the test and I failed. I passed the code, unlike most people, but I failed the questions because somebody told me I didn't have to know the cue signals and there was just enough of them that I failed. <laughs> Unfortunately, that was right at the end of, uh, of high school, kind of somewhere in there. I don't remember the year. And then high school kind of like took over the last couple of years of high school. And then I went off to college. So I never got back around to uh, taking the test until uh, I went through the first years of my career. And then um, in 1992, I got interested in it again. And I went and took the novice and I took it as a code novice. So I passed the code again. And then um, as soon as they turned on no code, I went in and went in one fell swoop to an extra. And uh, so since 92, I've been in ham radio. Wow. Well, Good and, job. And by the way, it, it occurs to me that you got me back into ham radio after a, a 50 plus year. Of, <laughs> well, I've, I've been on, I've always had a two meter 440 rig for a long time, but um, David and I met at a social event at the home of my martial arts instructor, who's his neighbor. And I talked to uh, that fellow yesterday or the day before, and he reminded me of <laughs> the strange occurrence of David Spolstra in the middle of the night out in his backyard, pointing a strange wand at the sky and mumbling to himself. Of course, it was uh, David's uh, satellite communication in the middle of the night. And at this social event, David started talking. We found out we were both hams. And uh, David started talking about satellites. And I thought, well, that is really cool. I need to learn more about this. And uh, eventually investigating that a little bit and meeting Denny on uh, uh, digital D star actually uh, between David and Denny, they got me interested in upping my license to extra and getting an, an HF rig. At which point I joined uh, a local club, the Indianapolis radio club of which David is president. 
and that club has been around since 1914. Yeah. And <clears throat> and he's been president the whole time. Yeah, I feel yeah. like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, uh, the, the, what what's of interest today and we we've been having club meetings by zoom and i've only attended a few of them because i just recently joined and the, at the last zoom meeting one of the members brought up w9 ims and how one could work for uh qsl cards and even a certificate if you made a contact on all three events associated with W9IMS. So David, what's that all about? Okay, so W9IMS is the officially recognized amateur radio station of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And if you work three events, what happens? Okay, so um, you want me to tell about the history a little? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so um, I love auto racing dearly. Um, I was a turn captain for the Associated Press on turn three for many years, and I had numerous series of photos go worldwide. And I love ham radio. Um, and um, so I wanted to join the two. And I always thought it'd be so cool to have an amateur radio station at the track. And so I started talking to them about it. Um, and I worked my way. I talked to the, um, the museum. I knew somebody there. And then I kind of was working my way up, but it was taking forever. Well, uh, a friend of mine, Bert Servas, uh, who's now SK, he was the um, um, chair of the Indianapolis City Council. And he thought it was a good idea too. And he knew Tony uh, George, the president of the Speedway. <laughs> he could just call him up, you know? I couldn't do that. So he and Tony George met and <clears throat> they drew up a letter agreeing that uh, uh, we would be the official radio club of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in 2004. So it started in 2004. And just so everybody knows, uh, we're just, all we have is the name. We don't get any kind of money from them or support. It's just being able to say we're the official club. So everything the club does, uh, the members do themselves. So the uh, describe what happens. There are, there are three racing events in this calendar year, correct? Yeah. So, uh, okay, and so, so um, um, it's, it's, Fairly standardized. However, uh, as many of you know, Roger Penske bought the track uh, a year ago. Yes, a year ago. Um, and uh, it, it, it's going to change a little bit. But it generally, we, we have three events. Last year, we only had two because of COVID. But we have three events. One of them is always the Indianapolis 500. And traditionally, it's been the Brickyard 400 is, is one of the events. And then we choose a third event. And so lately, uh, it used to be originally, it was the Formula One race, the Brickyard and the Indianapolis 500, which was really cool, but we lost the Formula One race. So now it's the Indianapolis, Indianapolis Grand Prix, which is in the beginning of the month. It's on the road course at the track. Then the Indianapolis 500, which I'm sure most people know what that is. And then the Brickyard 400, which is the NASCAR race. And so we um, do, for every event, we get on the week before up to the day of the race. So we include that day and we work as many people as we can on, um, on two to three transmitters. Uh, lately it's been two, we've been up to three depending on the year. And if you work us, during that event, you can get one of our QSL cards and our QSL cards are custom made for every single event. So uh, they're different, totally different, full color back, back and wide, uh, front and back usually. And uh, so if you work us for the Grand Prix and the Indianapolis 500 and the Brickyard 400, you can also get a certificate. But you can get a you can get a QSL card for any one event. 
Yes. If you don't happen to work all three, correct? Right. What we actually do is if you work us for the first event and you're going to try for the certificate, we encourage you not to send for the card right away. We, it, it, we get thousands of requests and it's quite an undertaking in itself just to fill them all out. It's amazing. Uh, but uh, so if you work us for the first event and you're going to try for the certificate, we ask you to just hold off and see if you can get all three. If you do, send us one card, follow the instructions with uh, one card with the three events and we'll process everything and send you a big envelope with all three cards and a certificate. And we do a cardboard stiffener in there and an envelope and everything else. So it's really nice. It's really worth your money. It's $5, it just barely covers the expense and you get all three. If you get to the certificate time after the third event and you didn't manage to work us for all three events, just send us a card with whatever you worked and we'll send you individual cards. The so the, the, uh, the cards are not printed until all three events are closed, correct? Uh, generally, yes. Um, we, we have lately, because the Brickyard is in August, we try and do a first run of just Indianapolis. Uh, so, so the Grand Prix and Indianapolis 500 cards to try and get some of the thousands out the door. But generally we don't get to the certificates until November-ish because uh, uh, we have them printed uh, by UX5UO um, overseas and it takes a while, but he does fabulous job, just beautiful. So uh, I learned about this in our, our latest club meeting and it intrigued me and I broke away from the Zoom meeting momentarily, went to the other side of my room and I worked the first race event. So, <laughs> and so I'm going for the certificate this year. I, I, you guys are making me into a, I, I, a very competitive person. I guess. I've always been competitive, I guess. So since I've got the first one, I'm going to uh, try for all three. And the reason we're uh, interviewing you today, we want to get this out to our listeners uh, before next week, because the uh, contact schedule for the Indy 500 starts Monday, correct? Monday. Next Monday. Yes. This coming Monday. This coming Monday. Yeah. Can you uh, uh, go to the uh, QRZ page and Absolutely. show us some QSL cards. Absolutely. For our listeners, you can find all required information on the QRZ uh, page for W9IMS. All the instructions are there. Past QSL cards are there. The instructions for working a single event and or the certificate are there. Yeah, so let me go through it really quick. This is the QRZ page for W9IMS. And first off, we thank everybody. Once again, we are not supported by the Speedway. So all the equipment uh, repairs and all the cards and certificates are, are paid for by members and the donations we get offsets the cost. And believe me, some years it can be expensive. We seem to go through amplifiers a lot. I don't know why, but the remote station must be too hard on them. So if you if you uh, come to the page, uh, you'll see that we've got an operating schedule. So you can always click on the operating schedule and you can see who's going to be on what band. This is just the um, people that have signed up to in our club to work these time slots. We have an, about an equal number of people that work ad hoc. So just because you don't see them on here, just because you don't see anybody listed during that time slot, doesn't necessarily mean that there won't be. And if you come to one of these pages, make sure you click on the correct tab. Like here's the schedule for Wednesday, click. There we go. Well, there's the schedule. I don't see uh, W0RLD on there, though. What's the uh, deal? Oh, I'm just new to this. They, they don't know <laughs> how, how efficient I am yet. Yes. Not everybody can be an operator. You have to, uh, we, have, we vet you before we allow you to be an operator. But 
Uh, so here's the three events. Here's the dates we're going to be on, and you can look at the schedule. Um, here's the frequencies that we're going to be operating near. Um, here's the information for the cards. So this is all the information for a card. All you need for a card is to send us an SASE with your um, contact info when you contacted us. Um, if you want to try for a certificate, here's all the information for the certificate. And once again, you have to have worked us for all three events that year. And this year it's the Grand Prix, the 500 and the NASCAR 400. And if you want to know a little bit of history, we've got under 500 miles to Im immortality. We've got an entire history of the club. So it talks about when we were made. We've had some cool special guests. In 2005, actually in 2004, I met Mike King, who's the chief announcer for the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Network. He actually came to our um, um, one of our stations and sat and worked hams uh, uh, around the world. So that was really cool. And they, they got uh, uh, QSL cards signed by him. Um, I got to interview the winner in 2005, Dan Weldon, and you can listen to the clip from there. So we've had a bunch of cool things happen uh, to the club during the years, and this documents it all. Then we have a little bit about statistics. We, we actually have a statistics page here. So uh, you can see, come on. <laughs> There we go. So you can see every year and which event and how many people we've worked. We have now worked over 200 and 200,000, 206,000 people we have talked to over the years. So since two, since 2004? Since 2004. So we're really proud of that. So, uh, and then um, the last thing I wanted to show you on here was uh, you can click on any of these links and you can see the actual cards and certificates we send out. So here is some of the cards we've done. Uh, like I said, they're, they're full color. Um, so, you know, like there's the front, there's the back. Oh, you can't see me point at the screen, but you know, the one with Roger Penske here buying the Speedway, that's the back of a card. Uh, so there's a, a Sato won the 500 last year. And uh, last year we did a four sided card for the 500. So we do that for special years. So like last year, it was pretty amazing that Marco won the poll for the Andretti. So we decided to make that a four-sided card. So the front was Sato winning, the back was Marco clinching the poll, and then the inside was Roger Penske giving the command. And then uh, we also had some of these these uh, uh, just miscellaneous pictures here. I'm glad you explained that because I was trying to figure out how you got four sides out of a two-dimensional card. <laughs> really narrow images on the sides. <laughs> yeah. And then um, this is the uh, certificate for that year. So if you get the certificate, we print your name in the square. And so we've got them for, um, um, you know, every... We've got them for every year since we started. And you can go look at all of them here. So for example, let's go to our first years. Our first years, our first three years, we didn't have enough money to get new cards every year. So we used the same cards for the first three years. So <laughs> that was the Indianapolis 500. That was the uh, Formula One race. And that was the Brickyard race. Uh, and then there was our checkered flag award. We call it the checkered flag award if you work us. So hopefully that gives everybody an idea of what they can get by working us. Did you ever print any cards with pictures of the operators and the station? I'd like to know more about your equipment and antennas and how you uh, set it up. Yeah, we've got some. I don't remember what years they were. Let's see. 
but if you give me a second here, we can click through a couple and I should be able to come up with some. Let's see. Not that what year. kind of equipment are you using this year? Um, okay, so we've got a uh, pro um, 756, ICOM 756 pros. Uh, one of them is an original pro that was that actually uh, uh, donated to us for use by the uh, W9RCA club. And the other pro is my personal pro. Um, and so we've got, we've got that. Uh, uh, so we've got two stations. I can't look and talk, obviously. We've got two <laughs> Don't give them any coffee or gum. <laughs> yeah, so we've got two stations. One of them, two remote stations. One of them is at my house and I've got a pro with an amp. Um, I've got a heat kit amp and um, I've got a uh, inverted V up about 60 feet. And the other station is Jay Krause, W9TC. And he's got a tower with a uh, high gain tribander. And um, it's, it's up about, um, it's actually on the website, it tells you, let's see. Oh, so you're not operating from the race course, you're oh, doing it from home. That's actually a good question. We wanted to work from the race course. I desperately wanted to work from the race course and we until we found out that the Indianapolis Motor Speedway has a blanket uh, five watt limit on transmitters around the track oh. Oh. because and we decided that it would probably behoove us not to interfere with like the ABC broadcast or the telemetry to one of the cars that would probably give a bad name to ham radio. So we decided that we needed yeah. to run outside of the track. So we have always uh, uh, operated remotely. Using oh. all of you are using the club call station or the club call sign. Yes, uh -huh. using the club okay. call sign. So how, how does that the, that is the people who are making the contacts they are connecting to these two uh, transceivers remotely from wherever yes. they live yes that is how it works and <clears throat> we have um n1mm on each site and they're networked together so when you can when an operator works somebody they also see whether we worked them on other bands and, and the different events. So they can see the entire history of that operator for that year. Okay. So, so how does, the, I'm interested in the process. You have thousands of people applying for these cards and certificates each year. Yes. You don't hand fill out the data on those cards, do you? How, what is the process you use to validate the QSOs and print the cards. We have uh, we have computers so people can you can look up the log, and we we meet somewhere. Um, we um, uh, um, we've met at restaurants. Uh, we've met numerous places depending on how big the group is uh, that helps fill out. And uh, so between operators and people that help fill out cards, we get about thirty hams involved in this wow and um last year we um the salvation army offered to let us use their site so that we could socially distance and everything and we had about i think it was like 15 16 people and uh, we filled out the cards and certificates so uh, it's it's a big undertaking um basically everybody gets a pile of envelopes you open them up and you've got your stack of three cards and you fill out the cards, and if it's a certificate, uh, you uh, fill out the, the uh, big envelope, and you put the cards in the big envelope, and you write their call sign on the flap, and then the certificates go to somebody else who uh, <clears throat> prints out the certificate uh, with the call sign and puts it uh, in the envelope and seals it. And wow, it's, it's, oh, it's so the, a big endeavor. undertaking. It's it's usually 
we do, like I said, we try and do cards after May. So get some of them out of the way. And then we do the final card party where we do all the rest of the cards and all the, all the certificates. And it's two solid 10 hour days with 15 people. Wow. I would think so, you'd be using labels and printing it digitally. All the, the little sticker to put over the card. We tried, but the, the, we actually did try that one year, but the problem is it's um, um, then the label or becomes the problem. Oh. Um, because, because now you got to walk up and tell the guy printing the label what the call sign is and then go back to your station and stick everything. And it just became a nightmare. It's, it's faster to do it by hand. Plus the nice thing is, um, you know, we can, write in little notes like right. you know we often get people that we're their first ham radio contact well wow. and so you know we can write in there hey you know congratulations yeah. on being you know first much, ham radio much contact more personal things like that yeah uh-huh and we can thank people that donated to help us do get new cards and certificates things like that so I'm, I'm, I've been looking through these in the background. I know we have. Oh, well, there. Actually, there's one. There's a Brian oh, yeah. 9 IND. Okay. So that's one of our operators. Okay. Very so, good. So, yeah, we, we've different years, we've had some of the operators on it. I probably passed. So now, do you? Uh, oh, yeah. There's a, a J. I Krause. didn't see your list there, but do you guys ever operate on uh, your All Star connection to your? repeater and by the way david you and i first met through your all-star node you might remember me checking in there and i asked you if you knew jim brown he was brand new in the club at that time but uh this is probably a couple of months ago and yeah. since then we've got jim on all-star now too yeah uh no we have not done that um we've been just hf well actually that, that was another thing we started doing uh we started the very first couple of years, we tried sideband and CW. Guess what? CW doesn't work. <laughs> you, you try and explain what the special VIN is on CW, and an hour later, you're still talking. <laughs> so that doesn't work very well. Um, and then um, uh, we tried an experiment the past two years doing FT8. Well, we crank through about 3,000 FT8 contacts and we only got five card requests. Oh, really? And so that was, that was you know, 10, 12 hours of, of FT8 to do that. And we got five requests. So it just wasn't the, worth our time. I mean, I've been adamant ever since we started that the only reason for a special event is to get cards and certificates in amateur radio operators' hands. And the only way to do that that I can see is uh, sideband. So you can explain what they need to do and where they need to go to see it, and you can talk to them. And that, that, does, that makes, like I said, thousands of contacts versus CW and FT8 got us nothing, really. Well. Wow. Well, plus your beautiful cards can be put up on their wall to show it to all their friends. And if they've been doing it over the years, that's quite a collection. It is. Yeah. Um, so right there, you can see in the middle there, that's a W9TC, Jay Kraus. He's the uh, other remote station. Cool. So we do have some. Very good. Of course, a lot of hams like to see pictures of beautiful girls on their cards, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I didn't know if that was politically correct, but uh, we, we try and always um, we get a ton of requests for bet. Uh, pictures. So we always try and get some of the uh, race fans on the um, cards. Oh, there's me cool. right there. There's me with the um, Crown Royal girls at the track. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, funny so this is very very well laid out you guys are very organized i'm totally impressed so i'll stop sharing here 
So tell me more about your satellite adventures. I got into satellites over a year ago and I'm having, have been having a lot of fun with it. I've uh, made a lot of contacts. How are you on your grid squares? Ah, okay. So, um, um, I love satellites. <laughs> I, I can I, tell. <laughs> I love, uh, literally I've done every mode that, uh, amateur radio has to offer. I just, I just love experimenting yeah. with different modes. So, um, I always wanted to get into satellites. So I got a, um, a, uh, arrow antenna and um yeah. an yezu ft 530 handheld that it's a dual band um full yeah. duplex dual band and just with that alone over a three month period i've got uh 48 continental states and 175 grids just on yeah, the fm satellites good. yeah what's your favorite satellite um well, it used to be AO91, which went away, as you may know, and came back. But probably the most solid one right now is PO101. Right. It's as yeah. loud as AO91. And so, and yeah. it's on almost all the time. So it's really yeah. good. And just recently, I got uh, to, uh, I don't even know how I got on the magical list, but. Uh, a uh, UV SQ sat. Um, yeah, that. you don't know about that one. Uh, that one's up there, but it's been in commissioning. And I got this email and said, hey, we're going to turn it on for two passes over the United States. We'd like you to get on. And it was sent out to about 12, 15 people. So I got on and worked it during those two passes and it was every bit as loud as AO91. So when they release that for general use, it's gonna be a great satellite. Cool. Well, we'll have to get Jim involved in it by then. We'll get him hooked on something else. So so uh, I've, I've looked at some YouTube videos on this and it's just mind boggling to me. You, you have to change frequency as for the Doppler effect and you have to twist the antenna around and you have to try and remember to what the call letters are. And Oh my gosh. I, it, I, it's just mind boggling. It seems complicated. And the first 10 times you do it. Yeah, it is. But now it's pretty much effortless for me. I can, I can run in with 15 seconds to go grab up everything, hit the right memories, be ready to go and do it yeah. pretty effortlessly. Well, I'm you going to eat the on the satellites. No, um, I've only, um, I've done some of the linears, um, but I, so far I've mostly just done the FM ones. That APRS is a lot of fun. I've got a D74 that I use for that. And uh, as soon as you get in and get to heard by this International Space Station, your call sign appears on a map. It shows yeah. all this. Thing. It's really cool. That's yeah, the, that's my objective is to get on the map every time it passes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was really excited about the FM um, bird, the the FM station on the on the ISS. Uh, yeah. But um, the it, it was tough to get in because everybody wanted to be in so on the fm side they were just walking all over each other and then yeah. you might know they had a problem with a cable they replaced yeah. the cable which didn't work or something and then it was dead for a month or more and then they went out and changed the cable back i think to the original yeah. cable yeah. and now it's back on again well you know what your repeater is like if more than two people talk at the same time now you got a hundred people trying to go through the same <laughs> repeater it's crazy yeah, I actually uh, have, I've done presentations around Indianapolis. I've got a whole slide deck on um, b beginning satellites. And so, yeah, I, I tell people if this is your first time on a satellite and you're using the FM, do it really early at night or really late at night when there's almost nobody on. That way you can hear yourself come back from the satellite and you can work a few people. And once you get good at it, then you can jump into the middle of the day with the fray and, and be able to work everybody. Yeah. Yeah, I love satellites. The other thing, I don't have it here with me, but uh, I actually 3D printed a uh, CubeSat. So most people don't realize it. 
These satellites, AO91 is six inch cube. That's it. Wow. Six inch cube. Yeah. And they yeah. even have now these microsats, which are half that size, three inch cubes. Like a Rubik's cube. Yeah. Traveling at 17,000 miles an hour, 300 miles in space. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. And, and creating space garbage, too. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. But these ones are so low, though, that they'll get captured eventually and dragged into the atmosphere. So how, how do these get put up? Uh, well, um, AMSAT, the um, Amateur Radio Satellite um, Group, which is the official group that helps get them built and launched, uh, they're um, all piggyback. So whenever they launch a rocket, they usually use solid fuel. Well, they can't regulate the thrust. You buy these rockets like this will launch this much weight. And so you buy this booster and then a lot of the times they'll have the satellite on the top and they'll weight it with lead to get to the correct weight for the orbit they want to achieve. So you, they will sometimes uh, allow you to piggyback on them by, by they'll glom on extra satellites and things like that. Um, so that's how the original ones got launched. Now, uh, some of them are launched by the ISS. Um, um, uh, SpaceX just did one where they set a record, I think it was 146 satellites they launched with one fell swoop. It was amazing. But uh, so AMSAT uh, tries to piggyback on. Sometimes it's free. Sometimes it's a lower cost. So, um, you know, they, they get it going. So, but uh, I'm, I'm trying to think, you just mentioned one, one rocket launched a whole bunch of satellites. Mm -hmm. uh, what's coming to mind is shot coming out of a shotgun. That's about what it looked like. And, and so how do they... How do they get these things properly spaced out? You know, if you've got all these things coming out of this rocket at once, how do they get to where they're supposed to be? Well, you've got different weights and they're coming out at different times. I man, and you know, they don't come out as a block, they kind of come out one, 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 and so they eventually start spreading out a little bit. Okay. Sometimes the I rockets are spinning it. like SpaceX. They'll actually put a little spin on the rocket. So it kind of fans them out as they let them all go. That's yeah, what they're that's doing true. with their uh, uh -huh. Starlink satellites. Or, or we, had a, we had an earlier discussion about the uh, detrimental effect of all these satellites on astronomy because yeah. the reflected light from all yeah. these satellites is causing, you know, what, what used to be city lights, you know, the, uh, uh, the telescopes were not located, earthbound telescopes were not located near a city because of the city lights blocking the ability to view deep space. And now the satellites are reflecting light down to earth and essentially elevating the city lights <laughs> uh, effect uh, and causing problems for astronomy. And it's going to get much, much worse. Uh, apparently, I mean, SpaceX is going to make it much worse all by itself. All by itself. And there's another company. I think it's Amazon that's going to launch. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately, it's going to get much worse. I, I, you know, don't have any great answers for that. There's just nowhere around it, except for the fact that now they're talking about putting... Um, space telescopes on the far side of the moon and interesting things like that which could help a lot right wow. well david this has been a most interesting conversation we've sort of reached the appropriate time length to cut this off so thank you very much for telling us about w9 ims and other topics you're always very interesting as usual so uh, thanks for joining us here in the cafe and professor Jim, thanks for bringing him in. Uh, enjoy your relationship there as part of a, that great club. How exciting. It's been very good. Thank you so much, David. You're more than welcome. Thank you. Seven, three, seven, three from the Digicom cafe.